All right, we're going to go to uh, John chapter 13 tonight, and I'm going to try to cover uh, about 20 verses, 1 through 20. And as I begin, let me kind of give you uh, one of my uh, illustrations that Phyllis stated that I do these really good illustrations. Hopefully, this is a good one, too. Uh, pardon? I, I try to keep them good. Okay. So um, this is an illustration to kind of give us an idea of where I'm gonna, what the main issue is tonight. Um, I have twice in my life, um, I've done what's called the mud run. Has anyone ever heard of the mud run at Camp Pendleton? I've done that twice in my life. I haven't done it in about 10 years. And uh, now if I tried it, I would just probably fall in the mud right away and never get up again. But <laughs> it's six miles and uh, there's thousands of people running. You've got to get your spot in there. You've got to get on at like midnight on January 1st at midnight. You've got to go on to try to get in there. And I've done it twice with a group of people from New Beginnings. And um, what you do is you run, run, mud, run. And it's exactly what it says it is. You go through all these different places. One, one spot is you go, you're walking through a lake at about, it's probably, I don't know, maybe 75 yards. The water's up to here. Other spots, you're going through mud. You're, cl- you're running up hills. And there's spots where, as you're trying to go over these barriers, they have soldiers there in the mud there, and they're grabbing you and throwing you down in the mud. And they're having a really good time doing it. And they don't care if you're a guy or a girl. They just don't care, all right? And they're just dumping you every place. And you're doing all these things, and finally you're crawling under these wires, and it's mud everywhere. And so when you're finished after six miles, you're completely filthy. You're just dirty. You just got mud all over you. And so what you do, is, or if you want to, um, they have these tents. And you can go into these tents, and they have these, um, these spigots, these shower heads. You go in there, and you can rinse off and clean up and everything and, you know, we go in there and we, and we do that. But, but the reality is you go and you rinse off all this mud. But do you think it really gets all the mud off your body? No, no, it doesn't. You have to go home and you have to get in your shower and you got to get your shampoo and you got to get your bar of soap and you got to thoroughly wash your body clean because you are so the dirt and the, the it's just packed on you and you got in fact I bought a pair of running shorts cheap ones because I knew I would never wear them again after running in that mud run because it would be so bad and so but I but I enjoyed it but you had to go home wash thoroughly to get it all off to be completely clean we're going to talk Jesus is going to talk tonight at a certain point within John 13 1 through 20 about being completely clean and then washing certain parts of your body. And we've, we've, you've probably read that stuff before, okay? So <clears throat> tonight we're going to look at that eventually. But in John chapter 13, let's, let's do some buildup. Let's get to these points here. Verse 1 says this, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the what? To the end, that's right. And when it says he loved them to the end, it's the idea is that he, he loved them to the, to the final goal. In other words, they just completed all the training of, with Jesus over that you know, approximately three-year period that they've walked with him. Now, notice here it says at the beginning of verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover... So last night I'm sitting there minding my own business watching my favorite Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. Any amens on that right there? So, and so I'm a Jeopardy, big Jeopardy fan. And, so, and then I get a message, from, a messenger from Cindy here in the front row about was, did they have, did Jesus crucified on the Passover day or this and that? And I'm busy watching Jeopardy, so I'm not really thinking about these things. And so I gave her a wrong answer. And so I started thinking about it today, and I said, wait a minute, I gave her a wrong answer. So I, I messaged her back about three, three hours ago, four hours ago. I said, I, you know, I completely lost my mind on that one. That's not right. And so the, the, the answer I should have given her was that, yes, Jesus was crucified on Passover. When he comes to the meal here, it says, now, before the feast of Passover, so they're coming together and they're going to celebrate Passover, the meal, and then gonna, it's going to move into the Last Supper. But that night, they come in there that night, and they're going to celebrate that. Jesus will be taken, remember, somewhere about 11 or midnight from the Garden of Gethsemane. That's still 
Passover because that day doesn't end till sundown on, on, on Friday. And then Friday evening at sundown starts the Sabbath. So Jesus now will be on the cross on the Passover. Then they got to get him down, put him in the tomb before uh, Sabbath begins because once Sabbath begins, everything stops. So that's how you get your three days also. Don't think of the three days that he de- died, that he was, it's actually three 24-hour periods. He was, he was put in the, in the tomb um, uh, right before uh, that first day ended. So he was only there a few hours first day, then the full Sabbath day, then part of that Sunday. And those, that's how the three days that Jesus was in the tomb and then resurrected. That's how it all works right there. Did I thoroughly com- com- confuse you or are we okay on that one right there? Yeah or no? Yes, no? Okay, good. Now, verse 2. It says, During supper, the devil, having already put, it in, put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, <clears throat> verse 4, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Now, Judas, has he already determined to betray Jesus at this moment in time? And the answer is, yes, yes, he has. Now, keep your marker right here, and I'm sure in your notes you see it there, but turn back one, uh, a few few pages back. Go to Luke chapter 22, and we can see where where this, uh, one of the the places where this is stated, where he's already determined these things, and he's already set this kind of, this stuff up. But go to, to Luke chapter 22, and when you're there, we're going to look at verse 3 through 6. When you're there, say, I'm there. Okay, good. And when you're watching at home one day, uh, say you're there, okay? Now, verse 3. And Satan entered, verse 3, into Judas, who is called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. Now, the idea there, people can debate, well, he was demon-possessed, isn't that? I don't know. I don't know, but I know that he got into his head. I know that much right there. So, and he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. So now you see where Judas is setting the whole thing up. They were glad and agreed to give him money because remember, he likes money. Remember that? And he steals from the money box. Remember that? And which means he probably has to replace money that he's stolen. Remember that? And so he needs money. He likes money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. So he's going to try to get Jesus when Jesus is away from a massive amount of people. So now you see where Judas, at this moment, back to John 13, Judas is already set things up. Now, question. Think about this, and we'll talk more about this as we progress through John. But why do they not, when Judas is going to leave that Last Supper, why is Jesus not arrested in the Last Supper itself? I'll tell you the answer. Because Judas doesn't know where they were going to celebrate the Last Supper. You remember that Jesus sent two disciples to go find the upper room where they're going to have Passover, right? Peter and John. Jesus specifically doesn't let Judas go. Therefore, Judas doesn't know where it's going to be. So when Judas leaves the Last Supper, he's going to hurry on down to go get the officer's Come back and rest Jesus. But Jesus will not be in that upper room. And so I'll stop right there because later on when we get in that story in weeks to come, we'll, we'll add more to that story. But he, he's not arrested there because Judas didn't know where Jesus was going to celebrate this, uh, this Last Supper. Now, <clears throat> verse, look at back at verse 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands, that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Now, does Jesus know he's going to suffer, die, and rise from the dead? Say... Yes, he does. That's right. Now, if you think about that, and he knows all that, and he knows who he is, look at verse 4 again. Got up from supper, laid aside his garments, taking a towel, and he girded himself. So Jesus, knowing all this is going to happen, now he, he portrays himself or takes the position of a lowly slave. Does he not? And now he's going to do this. Now, a slave that washes the dirt off the feet of guests. Now, let me give you just a brief little snippet of this because in a, in a few minutes, we're going to go further into it. But when there would be a dinner, let's say it's at, um, let's say, Jerry, you invited us all to dinner and it's like 30 AD, you know, and we're all coming to dinner. Now, if we're coming to his house for dinner, 
He's a good host. So you and I, we would get there. He'd have someone, a servant at the door with a bowl and a pitcher and with water in the, in the, in the pitcher and he'd have a towel. As we came in, that servant, Jerry would have that servant there to wash our feet as guests at his house. That was customary and that was something they just, they just did. Now hold that thought because in a few minutes we're going to come back to Jerry's house, okay? And how Jerry takes care of us at that time. Now, so Jesus takes the, the position of this lowly servant. Think about that. He is God and yet he takes the position of the lonely, lowly servant. Do you know what the disciples do right after Jesus demonstrates how to serve, washing feet and this and that? They start to argue, you find it in Luke chapter 22, they start to argue among themselves who is the greatest. Think of how corny that is. They've just seen Jesus, God in the flesh, serve, wash feet, take the place of a lowly servant, and they turn around and go, which one of us is the greatest? You know, it's just crazy that they're not getting the lesson right on the spot right there. Now, I love the fact that Jesus is teaching us something very important. If you want authority in the kingdom of God, serve others. It doesn't work any other way. If you want authority in the kingdom of God, you've got to be a servant. It doesn't work any other way. Now, let's go back to verse 4. It says, He got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taken a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, he lays aside his garments, correct? Question, will he lay aside his garments in a few hours again? You better believe it. But in a few hours... Will he do it voluntarily? No, they will strip him of his garments. So he will lay aside his garments. And here he lays aside his garments as a servant washing feet. Question, who in the group is included in Jesus washing the feet? Who's in that group? Judas is in that group. Would you wash the feet of a guy who's going to betray you? Would you do that? If that's a big question, Jesus does that. Now, verse 6 so he came to Simon Peter, and how many know Simon Peter is open mouth, stick, and foot, right? He just does that. He's very, very spontaneous, and he's very extreme. I love the guy. I just love the guy. But So he came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Question. Do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Verse 8, Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Exclamation point. You're not going to do this. He's arguing with Jesus. Isn't that fun? Jesus answered him. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him. Now he changes the tune. He says to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Now, <clears throat> Jesus now <clears throat> has been washing the disciples' feet. He comes to Peter, and Peter now protests, no, you're not going to wash my feet, right? You shall never wash my feet. So he goes fully extreme. Jesus comes back fully extreme and says, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no, you have zero part with me in my life. So Peter changes his tune and says what? Then don't just wash my feet. Then wash my hands and my head. <laughs> Give me a full bath, man. If, that, if that's the case, I'll take that one right there. Which sets up the important teaching within this context here, which we'll get to in a second. But I want you to notice back at verse 7, because I just want to make a comment on verse 7. And this, Jason, you and I talked about, I shared with him earlier, but this is like, Jesus answered and said to him, what I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Every time I've read that verse in the last couple of decades, I feel like that's my life story. Anyone ever feel like that? What God is doing right now in my life, I don't get it. But afterwards, I'll find out at some point. At some point, I'll know. You know, ever feel that way? Yes. There's only a few of us that feel that way? Man, I feel that was like, okay, God, what are you doing? And then, you know, like we like to say, we always understand in reverse. Do we not? It's always way after the fact that I can look back and go, okay, that's why. But while I'm in it, I have no clue why. And I wish God would tell me why, because I just don't know why. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to so here we go. First point in your notes, 
And this is the beginning of this whole thing. The first three points are going to kind of play on each other. First off, bathing all over is a once for all time cleansing. When Jesus starts talking about bathing all over, it's a once for all time cleansing. This becomes a very important doctrine for you and I as followers of Christ. Verse 10. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. But it's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. Mm. Question first. Does Jesus know who are his and who are not his? You better believe he knows that. Does he know who the betrayer is? Yes, yes he does. Now, we'll look, let's, let's just dive into this a, a little bit more now. Okay. <clears throat> We've already told you we're at Jerry's house, right? Yes. Jerry's, man, he's cooking some good food. So he invites us over. And we all come over there. It's the first century. We come to the banquet. Now, what typically would happen is this. You and I have been invited over. We would take a bath either at our house or in a public bath because we're completely clean because we're coming to Jerry's house, right? As we go to Jerry's house, we're not driving a car. We're walking, correct? Do they have paved roads or cement sidewalks? No, they don't. What are they walking on? They're walking on dirt, probably wearing sandals as they're walking on dirt, as you and I are walking on dirt. What's happening to our feet? They're getting dirty. And so as we get closer to Jerry's house, we could look at our feet. We got dust and, you know, just kind of dirt all over there. When we get to Jerry's house, he's got a servant at the door. As we come in the door, that servant has the basin, the pitcher, and the towel. We come there, they take off our sandals, they pour water over our feet, and they wipe our feet and get all the dirt off our feet. Therefore, now, because we've already bathed completely, and the dirty part was our feet. Now our feet are clean, and now we are completely clean again. Correct? Yes. You see that? Do you see that? Now Jesus is taking that idea right there in that culture and custom, and he's going to use it to give us a, some really, really, really big spiritual ideas that we need to that we need to always understand. When we came to Christ, where all of our sins are washed away, where we bathed completely, say yes. Yes, but as we walk through this world, in a sense, do we get dirty with sin here and there? Yes, yes. yes, we do. Yes, we do. And so we need the part of us that's gotten dirty, that is sin, to be cleaned so that we can be completely clean again. Are you following the, the thinking on that? Yeah. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Now, let's take that further and explain that because this is where too many Christians get hung up and beat themselves up for many, many years of their life. Now, that's point two. I have a state and I have a standing. I have a state and a standing. Now, keep your mark here. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Go to the right a little bit. Just a couple books to the right. Romans 3. I have a state and I have a standing. Say that with me. I have a state and I have a standing. Okay, good. Now, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Now, watch what Paul, New Testament writer, what he says. And he writes 13, possibly 14 books, but 13 for sure. Watch what he says in 323 and 324. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Is that true? Yes. We've all sinned, correct? Yes. And sin causes us to fall Short, don't we, down deep, every person deep inside, we feel like we don't quite measure up because of sin. Any amens on that? That's what we all feel. Unbelievers feel that. They just don't know why they feel that. And that's why people in this world, some of them will push, 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 achieve, achieve, achieve to try to prove to everyone, look, I'm okay, I'm okay. But they'll never feel okay because it cannot wipe away that underneath feeling that I don't measure up in my life. And we have the answer to those things. Now, verse 24. Being justified. Say justified. justified. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption. The word redemption there is the idea of a slave bought from the slave market to be set free forever. Have you and I been bought from the slave market of sin to be set free forever by the blood of Jesus? The answer is yes. yes. Now, but we're being justified. 
by that grace. And we're redeemed. Oh, justified. Now, justified, question, what does that word even mean? It's a simple answer, and it means declared innocent. I've been declared innocent. Innocent of what? Of all my sins. Every last one of them. Every sin. Not half of them. Not 90%, but every sin in my life. I've been declared innocent. A good way to remember justify, the meaning is justify, just as if I've never sinned. Say that. Just as if I've never sinned. That's the idea of it. It's just as if I've never committed a sin in my life. Doesn't that feel good just to think about that? That I've never committed a sin in my life in God's eyes because it's all been washed away. Now, you take that, take that, that's our standing. My standing is I'm declared innocent. You got that? Now, you take that, keep that thought there. Let's go to a verse from Sunday, from two days ago. Go to 1 John chapter 1. And I would always tell people, I would commit 1 John 1 and verse 9. Try to commit it to memory. It's just a really good verse. 1 John 1, 9, when you're there, say, I'm there. Now watch this. We read it Sunday, but we'll read it again. It's way to the right. He says, if we confess our sins, now remember, do you remember what I said the word confess meant on Sunday? It means to say the same thing that God says. So whatever God says about that sin, we are to say the same thing about it. It's sin. We're not to wash it down. We're not to change it. We say the same thing that God says about that sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is righteous to what? Forgive, Forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. Okay. So when I sin, that means that I sin. That's my state. Okay. I confess that I've sinned and now it's all cleansed, all washed away. So look up at me. My standing before God, I'm justified. I'm completely clean. All my sins are washed away. But as I walk through the world, remember we're going to go back to Jerry's house, remember? As I'm walking to Jerry's house, I get that part of my life that's dirty. Remember that? Now, that's my state. I've got sin in my life, I just, and I need to be cleansed at the doorway, right? And so I confess my sins to God, and that part of my life of sin is completely clean, washed away, but I'm always in right standing before God. You got that one? Always. Now, here's the big question. Where should I hang out and dwell more in? My state or my standing? standing. You're standing. Why would I hang out in my state? Why would I sit there and dwell about my sins and what I did two weeks ago and what I did a year ago? Why would I do that? It's under the blood, right? Yes. Is it under the blood? Yes. It's all washed away. Now, <clears throat> now, let's take this and think about it a little bit more. Now, drilling down more. When Jesus talked about forgiveness, he typically, within forgiveness, he used the idea of blood to cleanse, correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. Because he's going to shed his blood on the cross to forgive sins. But in John 13, when it comes to cleansing, does he use blood yet? What does he use? And we're back in John 13. He uses what? He uses water. This is a whole different idea right here. Now, he's using water as the symbol. He shifts from blood for a bit, and he uses water. And there's a reasoning behind why he uses water instead of blood. Now, that's going to point three, which goes with the first three points, and that's this. God not only forgives us from sin, but he delivers us from the power of it. Did you know that? That's huge. He not only forgives us of sin, he delivers us from the power of sin. Now, Turn to Titus chapter 1. Keep your mark here. To your right. When you get to Thessalonians and Timothy's, there's five T's there. Get to Titus. It's the fifth T of the books. Titus chapter... Now, when you're there, tell me you're there. Because I want to say something before I read this. You guys there? Okay. Okay. Delivers us from the power. Think about this. That night in Egypt, they were slaves for 400 years. Put the blood over the doorpost and lintel. The angel of death comes over, and the firstborn do not die in there. But the firstborn die all in Egypt. Do they not? Because the blood did not cover 
them. They didn't put the blood over them. The Israelites that night were delivered because of the blood from the penalty of sin. Were they not? Were they not? Yes. Okay, good. Now, <clears throat> they leave. And they're, they're heading out. They come to the, the Red Sea. It parts. They go through. Pharaoh's chariots. They're coming back because they want to get these people back, make them slaves again. Correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. The water comes down, killing the uh, Pharaoh's army. Passover, they're delivered from the penalty of sin. Were they not? Remember I just said that? When the water comes over and kills the Egyptian army, now they're delivered from the power of sin. The Egyptians have no more power over them anymore. They're delivered from the penalty, and now they're delivered from the power of sin. You, you and I, same way. And when we get to heaven, we've already been delivered from the penalty of sin, by the blood of Jesus, we've been delivered from the power of sin, by the power of that cross. When we get to heaven, we'll be delivered from the presence of sin. Amen to that one? It'll be a complete deliverance. Now, that, that one I just wrote in, I thought, I'll just give you that one for free tonight, okay? But, let's, but let me take that further here in this whole idea that God forgives us from sin and He delivers us from the power of it. Now, look at Titus 1.12. Because Paul, writing to this preacher, pastor at, uh, on the island of Crete, um, watch what it says here in verse 12. One of themselves, a, a, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans, from Crete, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Is that a really nice commentary on those Cretan people? It's terrible, isn't it? It's like somebody, their own prophet is saying, these people, these Cretans from Crete, the island of Crete in the Mediterranean, they're just notoriously bad, bad people. And think about this. Paul leaves Titus there to pastor these types of people. Can you imagine that? Oh, joy. Thank you, Paul. I get to pastor these people. They're so, so nice, you know. But that's where he's at, all right? Now, <clears throat> here's the question before we get further in, into Titus. Is it enough from God to simply forgive people from, the, from their sins? Is that enough? And the answer is... No, no, I'm glad I set you up. That was great, all right. Because it'll make you think, okay. <clears throat> I'm going to say the names out loud of those who said yes right now, but no, no I'm joking. No, no, it would be like Jesus saving us and then leaving us on our own to improve our lives from our bad behavior. I never had power to improve my life before from my bad behavior, did I? Did you? No, none of us do. It'd be like, well, you're forgiven, but <laughs> you're on your own now, buddy. No, that's not enough. There's got to be something more to it than just forgiveness. Remember, and we showed this before, remember when Jesus tells that story about the demon that's cast out of the man and the demon goes off and he's looking for another host and he goes to waterless places. Remember that story? And he can't find any place. Can't find him because the demon needs a physical host to manifest. That's what he needs. And he'll use a human or use an animal. Um, but he says, I can't find any. So he goes back. He's going back to that guy that he came out of. And it says, he finds the house swept and in order. Well, think about that. It's swept clean. It's been clean, forgiven. But nothing has come to fill that house. That's the point of that passage. So the demon sees that. Well, he's clean, swept out, but there's nothing to fill the house. So he brings seven other demons worse than him. Does he not? And he goes into the house and the last state of that man's life is worse than the first state of that man's life. But what's the point of the story? The point of the story is, don't think that Christianity is self-improvement. It isn't. I can't improve my life. The demon's cast out. I'm trying to sweep up my life. It's not good enough. I need self-replacement, do I not? I need someone to come dwell in me, more powerful than me, kind of like meaning the Holy Spirit to replace me and that gives me the power to be able to change my life. Any amens on that one right there? Doesn't that make more sense? That's why forgiveness, great, but it's not enough. Now let's look at Titus and let's follow up on this. Chapter 3 and verse 1 through 5. Watch this. Remember water, okay? Remember we talked about water, right? White, does it say white? Okay, right, okay. Now watch this. 
Verse 1, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to, to, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. There's a mouthful, huh? To malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, here it comes. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. In other words, you, you can't save yourself by good deeds. It's impossible. But according to his mercy, mercy is not getting what you deserve. I deserve judgment. He's not going to give me that. By the washing, there comes a water idea, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Okay. What's going on there? Washing of regeneration. This is very quick. Here we go. Washing. <clears throat> it's the cleansing away of all our old evil ways in our life, right? We're cleansed, right? We've covered that already. Okay. But it's not just that. It's regeneration. The washing of regeneration. In other words, there's something that's been regenerated in me, but it's not from me. Something has been planted in me. Something has been put in me the moment I became a Christian. And that has regenerated my life and your life, has it not? And that Holy Spirit in me, through the power of the cross and the blood of Jesus, gives me the ability to walk a new life and let go of, let go of old ways, correct? Think of it like this. This is a crazy visual, but think of it like this. Let's, take you, let's say you took an acorn. What, is an ac what type of tree does an acorn grow? An oak. You ever seen a big oak tree? Yeah, they get big, they get strong, they get pretty. They're beautiful trees, actually. What if you put that seed, planted that in a tomb? Death. And you keep water in there. Eventually, that thing's going to grow, huh? It's going to grow big, beautiful, strong. No different. That's no different, your life and mine. We lived dead, separated from God. Did we not? Spiritually, and then here comes the Spirit of God planted in me. It's that acorn, and it's in me, and I read the Word, and I come to worship, and I fellowship, and I keep doing it, and that acorn grows, and that Spirit grows, grows until it grows strong and powerful, and I'm able to let go and be released from a many more and more and more old dead ways in my life. Does that make sense? Because that's what it does. It cannot just be God forgave me and left me. Because I can't change my life. It's impossible to change my life. I need the power of the Spirit of God in my life to do those things. It's implanted in me. Now, number four. God, move me. We are to take the heart of a servant. We're to take the heart of a servant. Now we're back to John chapter 13. Verse 12 through 15. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord, and the teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Verse 15. For I gave you an example, say example, example. that you should do as I did to you. So he gives them an example. He's been talking about holiness and cleansing, has he not? So now we see that he connects serving to holiness. In other words, it's not just you got to know stuff, it's you got to apply this stuff to your life. Amen to that one? But let me show you a really, 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 really cool thing that maybe you've caught and maybe you didn't catch. Um, look at verse, verse 13 again. He says, now watch close. You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. Now look at verse 14. Watch close. If I then the Lord and the teacher wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Did you catch it? Did you catch those two verses? Did you notice something kind of different there? Sequence. Verse 13, he says, you call me teacher and Lord. Verse 14, he says, I am the Lord and the teacher. Do you notice him reverse it? He goes from, you call me teacher and Lord. 
And then verse 14 says, Jesus just switches it to Lord and teacher. I think that's real important. Because what's happening there? I mean, how many, and Christians, how many Christians? We sit there and we say to ourselves, well, he's, Jesus is, is my teacher. And I'll, we'll see what it says, and I'll, I'll decide if I'm going to believe that and live that. Is that the way that Christianity works? No, you've made it teacher and Lord. It's got to be switched to Lord and teacher. Because if he's the Lord first, that means that no matter what I read in the scriptures, no matter what it says, he's the Lord, so I'm not going to make a decision whether I believe that and obey it. He's my Lord. I'm going to believe it and I'm going to obey it. You catch that? Yes. It's a whole reversal. That's the difference between somebody saying, well, I, you know, I'm a Christian. Well, no, you're a disciple. You want to be a disciple because he's the Lord and then you obey what he says. It's just that simple right there. Now, verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. Now, to be honest with you, that's a great verse for people like me, pastors, who hold any higher authority office in the church because I've got to remember, like Christ, context, I am not greater than my master, Jesus Christ. If he washed me, if he served, that's the role that I'm to take. Amen? The problem with pastors sometimes, and we see it here and there. It's not, it's not everywhere, but you see it. Sometimes we get a little bit too big for our britches, and then we go off and do some crazy things. Have you ever seen stuff like that? you got to remember as a pastor or any high position in church setting that, guess what? You're a servant, and that's what you're supposed to do. That's your role. Now, number five in your notes, point five is this. A true believer feels compelled to treat others as Christ treated them. A true believer feels compelled to treat others as Christ treated them. Now, verse 15 to 17. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. Verse 17. If you know these things, you are blessed if you what? If you do it. Very simple. Very simple. Look, he says, you should do as I did. So when you do as I did, in doing that, then you'll be blessed. So you should do as I did, and when you do as I did, you'll be blessed. In other words, don't just know it. Start to do it. It's just that simple. It's very simple Christianity. Now, verse 18. I do not speak of all of, all, uh, of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Guys, that's a thousand-year-old prophecy that he's quoting. A thousand years before. David writes that. He said, he who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Who's he talking about again? Judas. 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 Now, when you think, next time you, I want you to think about this whenever you read that verse. To lift up your heel, when you kick somebody, you kick them like that, right? You're kind of the front of your foot. But when you lift up your heel to somebody, it's like they've walked past you and you kick back or trip. Yeah. It's like you do it behind their back. It's like you try to catch them in a way like that. It's worse because you don't see it coming. And he said, this is the person that lifted up his heel against me. It's a whole different view of being kicked if you think about it. Now, verse 19. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass. Boy, I wish that was happening in my life all the time. So that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, I want to close on this thought. <clears throat> Did Jesus know Judas was a fake? We're still going to go to some scriptures, guys. So. Did he know he's a fake? Mm -hmm. How can you tell someone's a fake apostle? How can you tell? Because there are fakes. I've been in church 40 Gosh, what, 42 years? How long have I been saved? 43 years? There, there's fakes. How do you know? Verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, he receives 
whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Huh. So God the Father sends Jesus, and Jesus sends apostles and representatives. But how can I tell that that one that Jesus has sent is a real deal? How can you tell that I'm the real deal? What do you look for in those things? Let's see. Okay. Look at John chapter 17. You're not going to come back to 13. How do, you, how, do you find, how do you know? Look at John 17. How do you know the real deal? In John 17, look at verses 7 and verse 8. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. Let me say that again. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. How can you tell if I'm the real deal? The words that Jesus gave, am I speaking those words or am I speaking off those, different than those words? That's how you tell. That's how you tell. You should be able to start to discern. If I went off track, you should know, no, that's wrong. That's not biblical. He's not, he's not sent from God right now. That's, no. So you gotta, the, the real deal's in tune with the word of God. Now, now let me give you this last illustration. Um, so I've, I've seen a few fakes in my life in spiritual leadership. I've seen some. Not many, but I've seen them. And uh, I remember one case, not here. Uh, it's a church I came from to plant this church. We had hired this minister, and um, I was in, you know, I was like about 35 years old, 34, 35 at the time, and um, he was hired um, to lead the, a young adults group. And I remember meeting him, and I thought, he's a good guy, but there's just something didn't seem right to me, you know, but they hired him, so okay. Um, and so he started doing this young adults group. And we started getting kind of feedback as time goes by. Some of the things he's teaching in there, and what's he saying, and I'm thinking, well, that's not right. And I'm a real scriptural junkie, so it just really gets me. And so I remember there was the certain night that he would meet with young adults, our, our senior pastor at the time, he went in to sit in on the meeting to see if this person was teaching the right things or what. And he stayed there probably for a half hour, if I remember correctly, then our senior pastor left. We found out about a month or two later, maybe three months later, it's been so long ago, I don't remember the time frames, that when our senior pastor was in there, this young minister, was, had the Bible open, teaching from the Bible, this and that, but when our senior pastor left, this young minister closed the Bible and said, we don't need this anymore. And he put it to the side. And he, that's a statement he made, we don't need this anymore. And he led those young adults so astray. He got their minds so twisted, so turned, that there were some that walked away from God, never even came back to God. And this minister was a son of a very, very good, solid, well-received minister, man of God. His dad was a great man of God. But this young minister... Way off track. Way off track. And I've never forgotten that. See, because the whole point is, you've got to make sure that if anyone is sent from God, they speak the words of God. They don't go down their own trail. They speak what God's word says. Otherwise, they're not from God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. 
And Jesus, we just thank you for your word tonight. We pray, God, that um, these things, well, God, these things just settle in our soul. Thank you, Lord, that our, we have a state and a standing. We dwell in that standing. We've been declared innocent. We've been washed clean, God. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for giving us the power through regeneration. That you just haven't forgiven us and left us. You've given us the power to leave behind the old life. Thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. amen.